Lovely. All right. Uh, so while we're working out the technology, I'm just going to get started because the slides just are an enabler to the communication. So what we're going to be talking about for the next 45 minutes or thereabouts is about agile contracts. Now, who here works in finance or procurement? Oh, <laughs> one person. Oh, that wasn't, I was, was not, not expecting, expecting that. that. Okay. Um, this is going to be a, a, a talk not from a finance perspective, not from a legal perspective. I'm not going to give you boilerplate templates. I'm going to talk about when you're actually building an agile uh, contract, when you're engaging with a new client, how do you uh, work with them to actually build a contract that supports an agile approach, especially when we have a situation where your client or customer may ask for fixed price. So we're going to look at a couple of different topics. Uh, some we're going to look at trust. We're also going to be looking at the different types of fixing that can occur, as well as other types of contracts. So before we really kick off, does anyone have any particular burning issues that they'd like to make sure that I cover? No? All right, well, I'll just talk. And if I'm off topic or you want me to expand on anything, just raise your hand, interrupt, and happy to um, take this conversation where you want to go. Ultimately. You need to get something out of this. Yes? Yep. Absolutely. I will definitely be talking about that, looking at how, how you actually have those fixed price contracts where the scope is not clear. All right. go by the velocity points <laughs> he is uh, because he wants some quantifying value yep okay so. let me just make a note of that velocity velocity is an interesting one and there's some issues and we'll talk about what the issues with building contracts around velocity are it can be quite valuable and it, qu and it can be a good measure but only in certain circumstances and we'll talk about some of that all right so to kick off yep so yep So schedule, cost, and uh, scope, everything yep. is fixed. But why is that agile? Okay. <laughs> I'll so be talking about the different types of fixing, absolutely. All right, so to kick off, for those of you who don't know, my name is Evan Laybourne. Uh, I'm based out of Singapore, and I've been working in a business context with Agile for the last seven or eight years, taking Agile outside of IT and applying it to the wider business community. Right. So let's actually look at one of the key principles that you need to understand in order to actually be agile and have an agile contract, and that's trust. Okay? Trust between yourself and your customer. I use this metaphor. Note it's a metaphor. It's a simplification of reality. It may or may not be real. Oh, I have slides. <laughs> I'll use this for the time being just to finish this point. Okay? If we look at trust, if we look at four different layers of trust, all right. Can I get someone from the audience to come up for a second? Just as, come on, let me get. Hello, Evan. Pavan, do you trust me? <laughs> Ab good answer, absolutely. Why doesn't he trust me? Because we're down here. Okay? Right. We're down here. We have what we call um, a level of reference trust. Okay? So you do trust me a little bit. You trust me enough because you came to this talk, okay? You came to this talk because something is an interface between us, okay? Now, in a commercial context, it would often be a reference from Yelp or a reference from another client or just because their website sounded really good. So we start a relationship at this level of reference-based trust. Then we go up. Over time, as we build that relationship, okay? So what do you think the next level of trust is gonna be? Sharing information. How do two business partners share information? Testimonials, sort of, but it actually, it, from, a, um, from a business perspective, it actually comes down to contract. So we, at the second level, we have contract-based trust. I trust you because I have a piece of paper that says this, this is what we're going to deliver and there are penalty clauses and all sorts of wonderful things that if you don't deliver. 
Now, we've been working together now for a couple of years. Uh, we've gone through, there's been some successes, a couple of little failures, because failure always occurs, but overall, you're satisfied with my service sufficiently to bring me back in again, and again, and again. All right? What, do we have more trust? Do we still have a contract? Yes. Absolutely. The contract continues because our entire business model is built around contractual agreements. Okay? But what we call this is now identification level trust. I don't trust you or you don't trust me because of the contract. The contract becomes an enabler. But we trust each other because of experience, shared experience. Does that make sense? And at the very top, this never happens, or very rarely happens, maybe 10% of your uh, clients. This is what we call a partnership. How would you, if you were to trust me at the level of partnership, what does that mean to you? Did everyone hear that? Yep. You expect that you would share the problem together and that we would work together for the outcome. That's, I couldn't have said it better myself. You're absolutely right. A partnership level trust, it, think of this as a strategic partnership. We will succeed or fail together. Make sense? Can everyone give a van a clap? Thank you. So I want you to keep this trust level in mind as we go through the rest of this presentation. Because this trust model is exactly what your contracts are going to be predicated upon. All right? Now, I'm not going to talk about, uh, I'm not a lawyer. Don't, uh, I'm not going to give you legal advice about contract law. Lawyers have a very special understanding of how contracts work. What do people think a lawyer's primary obligation is to? Protect? Protect who? Protect the company's interest. Absolutely. Do they care whether your project is on time? No. Do they care if you actually get the outcomes that you wanted? Not outputs, the outcomes that you wanted. No. A lawyer is there to reduce risk. A lawyer, uh, no, let's take a step backwards. Uh, what, would, what do you think, a, uh, from your perspective, a successful contract would entail? Mutual agreement by both parties, abide by the law. Yeah, absolutely, that, that sort of thing. But I would actually say a successful contract from a technical perspective is the outcomes. Like, as two parties, we worked together and we achieved an outcome. And that outcome was successful. A lawyer is going to look at that and say, that contract is successful if nobody gets sued. Okay? Not, not whether it was the outcome successful, but about that. So, Always, when we're talking contracts, remember what, that we do have a level of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <sighs> a level of distinction between the two. Oh, that's just a quote. Um, now, there are three questions that you're going to, uh, or your customer is going to ask you before any project begins. Okay, can anyone guess what those three questions are? Well, the first one is the title of this talk. How much is this going to cost? All right. Can I guess what the second one is? How long is it going to take? And the third? Oh, actually, that's a good question. Will it solve my problem? That, they should be asking that. It normally is, well, what am I going to get? All right. All right. Now, there's an agile answer to all three of those questions, and we'll look at that at the very end. So I just want to keep those in the back of your head. All right. Let me just go through. Now. Agile Manifesto. We all know the Agile Manifesto. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. All right. Do we understand what that means? All right. If we have a contract, are we going to have a contract with, with our partner? Yes. So there is still value in that contract, but we want to be able to have that customer collaboration in place. All right. So we're going to talk about different ways that that can be achieved. So first of all, 
understand your workflow, understand the flow of activities, the flow of information, and the flow of requirements that go through from a contractual perspective. Right? When you have a team, okay, a team has a fixed cadence more or less. You're, I'm talking here um, software, and I'm talking here um, uh, uh, services for money. Okay? So where there are capital components, uh, this, this is not the right metaphor for capital, this is more for operational. Yeah. But when you have something that's fixed and a change occurs, then you've got really only three options. This pipe is your team, your team capacity, your team cadence. If a requirement comes in, you've got three options. Increase cost, increase capacity, all right? add more staff. What's the problem with adding more staff? You will actually increase your short-term lead and cycle time as staff are being trained. So whilst you may increase cost, there may be flow-on effects, um, downstream effects. So those will have to be calculated and mitigated. Second option, increase duration. All right. If I have a 10-week project and I add a week's worth of work, okay, then yes, I could add more staff to do it in the same time or I could do it longer. Or drop a requirement. Now I like to, um, everyone here knows what a change request is. In an agile perspective, especially where you have a fixed contract, start to think of it as an exchange request. Okay? Because that's one of the key points. Where you do have fixed scope or fixed time and you're unable to negotiate, you need to start to have this exchange request. I will take something out in replacement for what you're putting in. Okay? And you can build those concepts into your contracts. I've, that was this model, so we've already spoken about that. So, what are the ideal contract models? Okay? Time and materials. Everyone knows what time and materials is. Does anyone not know what time and materials is? Okay? I won't bother wasting your time explaining that. Why is this ideal for Agile? Because nothing is fixed apart from an hourly rate or a daily rate. I can, as a customer, work with you as a product owner or embed myself within the team and I can do the backlog grooming and change and as long as there is value. And one of the, I use this as, a, as an example of, sorry. I had a pen in my hand the whole time. All right. If we think of cost as a linear uh, expression, right, every iteration we're gonna spend 10,000, 100,000 rupees, whatever it is that we need to deliver work. We have a fixed team size, that is our a linear cost progression. Then we're gonna see business value do this. At the beginning of any piece of work, our, the business value that we're producing is probably not gonna be greater than our cost. Why? Because we're doing back-end stuff, infrastructure, downstream stuff, which is important. It's dependent on what we, uh, or what we're about to do is dependent on it, but it doesn't have high business value. At a certain point, we'll cross this threshold. The earlier we do it, the better, obviously. But when we cross this threshold, we start adding a net positive value in terms of what we're trying to deliver to the customer. There is a natural point where as the high value, uh, low effort capabilities, functions, outcomes, outputs are created, all right, we're gonna cross that threshold again and suddenly the project's not quite worth doing. That is the natural, not the only, but the natural point for a time materials based contract to end. Okay? Because the work that you're doing is no longer more valuable than the cost of doing it. Make sense? All right, so bear that in mind because we're gonna talk a little bit about, about that later. But there's another type of contract. The, the disadvantage of a time and materials is it's a linear growth. So from a vendor, here's a question, who's here is from a vendor organization? Surprisingly, very few of you, okay. Um, in a vendor organization, one of the problems with time materials is it's, I'm putting my people in and I'm having a fixed percentage profit on top of that. If I'm more efficient, then I'm actually gonna get less money. So there's no incentive from a vendor perspective to actually increase efficiency, except, of course, from a trust perspective. Okay, so as a vendor, if you wanna improve that trust, yes, you're gonna start to work on this and there are, you'll, identify efficiencies and so forth. All right? But at these bottom levels, especially at that level of contract-based trust, there is no benefit uh, to innovation. So what we do is we go to outcome-based contracts. 
Now, who, um, these are sometimes known as performance-based contracts, um, and uh, the, the, the standard, it all came out about um, uh, Boeing's power by the hour um, uh, uh, contract model. Who here is using an outcome-based contract at the moment, if you know of it? One of you, two, three, a couple of you. So an outcome-based contract is valuable when you can actually identify a business value to an outcome. So your work does something. Whatever that something is, has a net outcome. Now, I say power by the hour. The way Boeing um, started to change their uh, financial models was you pay us for the, each hour this engine is in the air. Okay? Because if the, if the plane's on the ground, you don't pay us a cent. Now, this is sort of a win-win situation because Boeing, of course, is, 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 getting, is going to get more money as, as, and the incentive is to keep the planes in the air and the engines efficient and going, whereas the airlines, of course, it's beneficial for them because if they're grounded for some reason because there's an issue with the plane, they're not still paying for that engine. All right? Who can think of an example in software, in IT, where this is an appropriate business model or contract model? Software as a service? Yeah, that's an outcome-based contract. Yeah, subscription-based models, absolutely. What about if um, outside a subscription-based model or a software as a service? Anyone think of other examples? Maintenance, yep, maintenance contracts. Um, yes. Maintenance contracts tend to be better in terms of a combination of these two, where there is a sort of a capped t and uh, a, a fixed, uh, um, a fixed scope or fixed time capability uh, contract with an outcome-based incentive on top. Right. Defects. Here's a question. If I, as a business, not as a vendor, but as a business, you're producing a piece of software for me. Does the number of defects in that product actually impact my outcome? Not output, outcome. Sometimes, yes, absolutely, if they're critical defects. But from a substantive, how many of us use software that crashes every now and then because there's a bug? All right. Defects are a part of a production environment. So having an outcome-based contract based on defects. Yeah. That's a fair point. So where quality is a critical measure, um, if I was in, say, the biomedical space, um, then absolutely, or the, the aeronautic and producing biomedical devices, software, and so forth, and yes, these sort of uh, these outcomes are more important to me than anything else. So an outcome-based approach will be valuable there. All right. So any other questions on this? Otherwise, I'll move on to some of the others because there's a couple of topics to cover first. Make sense? Lovely. Now we look at fixed. Time, cost, and scope. Now, I want you to be aware. When someone says fixed price, the implication is fixed time, cost, and scope but it is not necessary. It is possible to have one of these axes fixed and the others flexible. And when we're talking about an agile contract, we actually want to try and keep some level of flexibility. So when we have a fixed cost-based model, all right, and, an example, and this is where time and scope are flexible. Okay? An example of this is providing maintenance support. It's going to be 10,000 rupees a week, forever. All right? But how, like, how long it will be, we can cut the contract short or, or whenever. And the work that you do in that contract, we'll decide that on a day-by-day -day basis. So that's an example of a fixed price model, but a flexible time, flexible scope model. Make sense? Now, in these, in, in these, instru in these contexts, when we're talking about a project with fixed price, um, but flexible time and scope, then we want to make sure that we do have a level of emphasis placed in iteration zero right, to plan. Because we need to have an assessment of minimum viable product, minimum marketable feature. Right? Because if we say it's going to be X 
Okay? But scope is flexible, fine. But the customer's going to have a minimum scope in mind. All right? So we need to say X as a, as a quote has to be greater than that minimum viable feature. We're not doing a full formal quote of all the features of all the story points, just what is more than minimum. Okay? We deliver this as we would any other agile project, but be aware that if you are using a fixed price, you should be using the shorter iteration cycles. Longer iteration cycles have a tendency for greater overruns and poorer estimation. Right? Where you have the shorter iterations, one to two weeks, you're much better able to control those costs. All right. So let's look at fixed time then. Now, this is usually when a project or a capability needs to be delivered by, uh, in most organizations, the end of the financial year. Okay? Um, but for example, you may have a, uh, some marketing material that needs to be ready for a product launch. The product launch is fixed right, because of all the, all the media will be associated with it. So the work that you need to do, the website or whatever, has to be ready by that date. So this is a fixed time, flexible cost, flexible scope. Right. In these instance, we can use historical velocity data. Now, this is where it gets dangerous. Okay. What is velocity? That was not rhetorical. Someone tell me what velocity is. Number of Number of X required to, um, so it's story points per iteration, simplistically. It doesn't have to be story points, there can be other measures, but in most cases it's story points per iteration. Okay, who estimates a story point? Theme, what is one story point worth? How many hours is one story point? <laughs> yep, so when we have historical velocity, if we have a consistent team the same team, they've been together, we have historical velocity data for that team, we can actually draw a progressive trend as to, okay, your velocity measures are more or less stable, there's always some level of deviation, right? So we can use that as a baseline. If it's a new team, or the team is fundamentally changed, you pull out three members and put another three in, okay? You do not have historical velocity data. At that point, you just take a guess, because you've got nothing else to go on. All right. um, where it is fixed time, make sure you strictly enforce time boxes. Don't let any sprint overrun. This is Agile 101. But the more things that are fixed, the more agile you need to be. You can't, if, the more you deviate from like, good agile practices, the harder it will be to actually maintain some of this stuff. All right. Uh, I won't bother going into that for now. Fixed scope. Okay. We know what they want, but cost and time are flexible. This doesn't happen that often. Normally they'll fix scope and another access. Right? But this could be somewhere where, for example, there are a series of financial reports that need to be produced uh, for, reg for, for regulatory requirements. How long it takes, how much it'll cost can be varied. Right? In this, once again, we have a major iteration zero. This is why I call this heavy agile. This is agile where you're not doing agile. This is agile where you're doing waterfall because you have a plan up front. Right? But sometimes, this is what a client wants, you can still use agile technical practices, you can still iterate, and there's some level of flexibility in time and cost, okay? but your scope is going to be locked down. This is when I talk about exchange requests, where you have a fixed scope contract, and, a chain, and they do want to change to scope, because customers always change their mind midway through. You want to exchange, because your scope is fixed. Right? Um, so on and so forth, fairly standard stuff in terms of delivery. You deliver it as you would any other Agile project. Now let's look at the combinations. Fixed cost, fixed scope. This is terrible, okay? This is where you have, you might have some flexibility in due date, okay? But it's gonna cost you a million rupees and it's gonna, and this is our list of specifications. All right, does that sound Agile to you? No, it's possible. Okay, it absolutely is possible to plan it, okay? but you need to increase your um, uh, contingency. So if you were in my talk yesterday, I spoke about contingency from a financial perspective. Same thing applies here. Okay? My contingency, either as a percentage or, or a fixed amount, gives me a buffer. All right? Now, most projects, most organizations will run about a 30% contingency. The level of contingency that you run will depend on the 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for, will depend on the overarching cost. Okay, so where, um, sorry, not cost, risk. So where the risk is high, then you're going to increase your contingency. All right. Once again, you're delivering this like you would a normal Agile project. We're not really making much changes there. What about fixed time and scope? This one's not too bad. Who can think of why this one's OK? Because we can add new resources, OK? Because we know what the outcome is going to be. And if this is a simplistic, repeatable project, then we probably do know what the outcome is going to be. If it's something that's simplistic and repeatable, we can probably estimate the, um, the duration of it relatively easily. But where things are unexpected, he, here's the problem with fixing. Fixing doesn't allow you to manage the unexpected. How do we manage the unexpected? With money. All right. So here, we do have flexibility in, in, in increasing our staff to do that. This type of contract is usually only used internally, not between external partners, unless they have some sort of strategic partnership. But of course, my favorite, fixed time, fixed cost. This is actually what you want to go for. If your client organization is very heavily focused, emphasizing they have to have something fixed, either because they don't trust you because you're a new client, okay? so you've got to have a contract that protects both parties, or because they're lawyers, um, they're every, uh, the, the relationship that you have maybe with one party in that organization, but their procurement department has all these processes that are expected, then in that case, you're going to have to start fixing. This is, if we're going to be fixing stuff, the best type of fixing that you can do. Why? Fixed time. Must be done by a certain date. OK? Straightforward. Absolutely. All right. Fixed cost. All right. It's going to be a million rupees to deliver. That is our cap. This is sometimes known as cap T and M, okay? because our scope can change. The customer has a level of surety, a level of risk control that it's only going to cost us this much money and no more. Great. But what does the customer want? The customer doesn't know what they want straight away. Of course they don't. That's why we use Agile. Business is a chaotic environment by its nature. So because it's chaotic, things occur outside of, outside of predictability. Okay? Finance and procurement like predictability, right? but predictability is the enemy of good. It's the enemy of adaptability, the enemy of Agile. Right? We want a level of predictability to make people comfortable but people have to start learning to be comfortable with unpredictability. People have to start learning to be comfortable with a little bit of chaos in their lives, because that is ultimately the nature of the work that we're doing. Software is a creative art, not, an, not a science. Do you agree on that? All right. So who here actually uses these kind of uh, a fixed time, fixed cost model? Yeah, some of you? Yeah. Who here? Oh, sorry some examples and so forth. Who here then uses fully fixed? All right. What do you think my recommendation is? <laughs> Cancel the project. Now, that may seem like a joke, but it's actually very serious. All right. um, how, and, and forget agile for a moment. Even think waterfall. All right. Do you have that level of surety and predictability in the delivery of your project that you can guarantee delivery by a fixed date, with a fixed cost, with a fixed scope? Is that possible? And here's the greatest lie ever told by project managers. Yes, it is. Okay? No. I, Every project manager will say, yeah, we want to fix this down. We're going to run through the plan. We're going to have our Gantt charts, da, 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 da. And sure, if I'm running an engineering project, that might even seem reasonable. But I can tell you, having worked with engineering firms, um, both in the biomedical and, um, and construction spaces, even engineering projects run over all three of those constraints. So you might have a contract that says, I'm going to deliver this physical building by this time and this cost. But let's face it, they're going to run over it. Greatest example, um, uh, people here know in Singapore, the Marina Bay Sands, that building that has a boat on top of it. Yep, have you all seen that? Yep, that ran B 
billions of dollars over budget and was about three years late. All right. it, was a, it was a waterfall project. And actually, sorry, on that side note, would you consider that to be a failure? It was billions of dollars over budget and it was several years late. Is that a, is that a project failure? Simple answer, yes or no? Hands up if you think yes. Hands up if you think no. So at a project management level, it is considered a failure because the project plan was X and we were so far over the tolerances in this project, it was unable to be delivered. So, but from a business perspective, initially, yes, it was a failure. But that building paid off its costs, even the cost overruns, within six months of opening. To be fair, they have a casino at the bottom, so that kind of helps. But um, failure is actually a very interesting, and I'm off topic here, I'm sorry, but failure is one of those interesting things where no matter what is fixed, whatever is delivered, right, sometimes the outcome is still achieved. Right? So, I always remember that sometimes failure isn't quite as black and white as we might think it is. Yes. No. Does the developer not talk to the business? This is true. So, yep. <laughs> Question is, how are we going to control the marketing people? So, um, I actually gave a talk exactly on that on <laughs> on, on Thursday. Um, uh, there's a way of actually interfacing and communicating with marketing in their language to try and get them to understand the, the flow of work within an IT project. One of the things that we've done is actually to start embedding marketing and sales into delivery teams as cross-functional teams. So once they're truly cross-functional and you actually start to have that sense of team and that, that sense of co-ownership of the outcome, then we actually start to, start to control those marketing people. Um, but yes, absolutely. If they go out and sell the Taj Mahal, and you go, we can't do the Taj Mahal for a thousand ringgits, then we're going to have. There's always that breakdown in communication. But it's actually your responsibility as a developer, as someone in IT, to actually work with sales and go, you need to stop doing this because of this reason here. You're keeping us down here. We can't deliver. We can't keep doing this. We're going to burn staff. We're going to. Get rid of commissions. Absolutely. I've done this for five or six organizations so far. Um, a, there is no evidence, that's right, there is evidence to show that beyond a certain base level of remuneration, commissions add no greater output or outcome from the person receiving the commission or the bonus. All right. Secondly, commissions add a level of um, jealousy or us versus them. Right. And once you actually embed sales into your development team, if you have them being uh, earning a million dollars every time they make a sale and the development team earning like 100, 100K just for turning up, then we're always going to have that dichotomy. So you actually need to start bringing the relationship to an even footing. So removing the commissions is one of the, most, is one of the best things you can do for a sales team. And let's face it, if a salesperson doesn't do their job, then you fire them, same as if a developer doesn't do their job. So all the points of commissions aren't actually true. I'm completely off topic, and I'm going to bring this back in, but if you want to have a conversation after this, let's do that. Now, the other point about this, okay, when projects do do this kind of um, approach, what they will do, oh, no, sorry, take a step back. When an organization, when a client organization says, we want fixed time, cost, scope, what they're actually saying is, we're going to give you the risk. We don't want to hold on to the risk of this project not delivering as we expect. And this is the legal think. But what that's actually misleading, because what actually happens is the risk, you give the risk straight back to me. Why? How? Because you charge me 30, 40, 50% more. Okay, straight away. 
So just because I, I tried to give the risk to you, but no, you gave it back to me. So it's misleading to anyone in the first place to think that this is a risk mitigation strategy. It's not. Okay. Now there's there is a silver lining, but okay, if you start with time and materials, if you do a small time materials piece of work, cap time materials, limit it to a couple of weeks, to um, uh, to to a couple of months, to understand truly understand the business the intent of what the customer is trying to achieve. And at the end of that, let's say it's two months, if, they and it, if we decide not to go ahead, then that was probably the best decision. Now, if we do decide to go ahead, and they still want this, because the great thing about working for T&M for a couple of months is you get to actually build this trust up. Right? If they still want capped everything, fixed everything, then you have a lot more confidence in understanding what they want, how long it's going to take, and from there, you can calculate those costs. Okay, so this is the one silver l lining to a client who wants fixed everything. Negotiate some level of flexibility in the beginning. Make sense? So, uh, can someone tell me how much time I've got left, sorry? Five more minutes, love it. Per I'm on time, wonderful. Here are the three questions. What am I gonna get? What's the agile answer? No, it's not all of it. It's whatever you tell us you want. If you want all of it, you'll get all of it. At a certain point, you'll decide you don't want it. In which case, we'll get rid of it. Next question, how long is it gonna take? What's the agile answer to that? As long as is necessary. No, 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 no. it'll take as long as is necessary. All right? If you're gonna give us this much work, it's gonna, and then it'll take this much time. All right? And how much is it gonna cost? What's the Agile answer to that? As much as you're willing to spend. Right. <laughs> this, is not, <laughs> this is not a blank check, by the way. Right. Like, this, is not, and, and this is the argument they hear against Agile. Oh, it's developers writing themselves a blank check. No. It's the customer taking control of their spending. Not the developers writing a blank check. It's the customer taking control of their spending to decide when to stop. And that's the critical part about this. Okay. If you have a customer who understands, who partners with you at an agile level, who has a level of trust with you, then you can do this effectively. Okay? So, because I have a couple of seconds, this is a sort of a PS. Okay? You, you have a second two-minute talk. No projects. All right? and, with a, with, with, and, with, and with apologies. This is something that uh, I've been working on for the last couple of, um, uh, about six months now. Change needs to be continuous. When you have a project, it has a start and an end. Nothing in, or very little in IT has a start and an end. You need to start thinking, and when we talk about customer trust, if you're here, if you're in the upper levels of that, you can start to move away from projects, and you can start to move towards outcomes. You can start to walk, move towards continuous, outcomes-focused, change, continuous change, continuous deployment, DevOps, all these things start to come together to give us a wonderful platform in order to get rid of what is a horribly overused concept, which is a project. I'll finish with one thing to understand. Activities, there is a change exists on a continuum. When we look at activities on a continuum, we have activities which are quick, activities which are slow. Activities which are high value, activities which are low value. All right? we, when we're actually doing continuous change, we should be able to map any activities that we're working on into this sort of matrix. And by looking at any activity here, a customer and a vendor working together, or whoever has that contract, whoever has that relationship, whether they, they can be internal contracts, can start to actually effectively plan continuous change and continuous outcome improvements. All right, now I only had a couple of minutes, so I'm not gonna talk any further about that. I just wanted to give you a second mini talk. All right, now, questions?
I've got clients, sorry, <laughs> sorry guys. So I've got clients who have given us a lot of trust. So they basically believe in us and we were using kind of a waterfallish kind of a method. Yep. So we have continuously given them outcomes and they trust us because of that. And there's a lot of data that we have. So, you know, healthcare and sleep industry has a lot of data. So now, now that we're going into the second phase of uh, business, so my next set of uh, clients are going to be hospital systems or chains of hospitals. So they prefer kind of an agile-ish model. So how do I make sure that I keep both sides intact? Uh, how, do I, how do I keep their trust there and build trust with the second type of? Yeah, so um, you're going to have trust with multiple parties. So um, it's about structuring your organization in such a way that you can actually build trust. And one of the things that some organizations do as a cost-cutting measure is, is that they will focus on certain uh, organizations uh, clients and ignore others. Trust can be lost. Okay, so you need to actually have the wherewithal and the struct and the organizational structure to support that. Um, I do. Uh, I'm on the board of advisors for about four different startups, and I've done work in the biomedical and, and the health space. I worked for Ambulance Victoria back in Australia for for a few years. So look. Um, this is something that a lot of organizations, a lot of health-based organizations, are struggling with. Um, but it's about st structural accountability. And it's about making sure that the relationships aren't forgotten just because you're moving to a new market segment. Uh, let's have, that's a very detailed conversation. We probably need to have that in, outside after this. And one more thing. So um, trust is not basically just between the client and, the, um, I mean, and me. So there's, a, there's a set of trust between me and my team too. Oh, absolutely. So, so trust is everyone it, trusts everyone. Everywhere. I hope you all now are at least sort of here with me in terms of trust. Like, you trust me, or actually even maybe identification, you trust me because you said, hey, Evan gave me some good advice. I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna trust Evan at this level of identification because I now have some experience with Evan. Now, does that mean that you're going to hire me without a contract? No, okay, because you don't have that much trust in me. All right? And you shouldn't, absolutely you shouldn't. You shouldn't have that much trust in anybody after you've met them for an hour, all right? But we're always building a level of trust with everyone in every part of our organization, in every relationship that we've got. So um, I'll give other people a chance to talk, and maybe you and I can have a conversation a bit after this. It's a nice talk, Ivan. But a uh, quick question about time, cost, and scope. How often in a particular project do you think it is necessary, or if, it necess if it's necessary at all, to actually change the entire working model? For example, if you're fixed time, fixed cost, and flexible scope, and uh, maybe after three months you realize, hey, this is not working for me. Do you recommend a change at project level or this should be a company-wide mandate? Because it depends on the contract. So contracts tend to be in force for a duration. So um, the problem with a contract is once you've got it, it's hard to then move to a different kind of model. Um, but if you do have the opportunity, if something's not working for you, right, and here, like when I say cancel the project, I'm actually really true. Sometimes you have to step out of that contract and go, our organizational reputation is going to be negatively damaged because, because of our contract, because of the way that we're interacting with you, we cannot deliver what you're asking us to deliver. We need to pull back, and even if we have to pay a, a penalty clause, sometimes the reputational uh, impact and our trust impact, I'd much rather rehire someone who was honest enough to pull out of a contract with me because they went, it's not going to work, then someone who spent 22-hour days, burnt out half their staff, and then still didn't deliver uh, on time and on cost. So these are all the things that you do need to balance up in terms of are we going to change the contract and are we going to change our structural embedment of how our project or how our organization operates. As a general rule, I actually suggest that when you are doing an agile organization, Project, I don't like projects, obviously, um, but um, projects themselves are temporary. If you're going to make a substantive change, you have to do it at an organizational level. Uh, but I'm biased because that's what I do for a day job. So, yeah, uh, there are uh, there are scenarios in the organization where where we use fixed price, fixed scope, fixed cost, and we use change management as a tool to subside the loss. Yeah, and that is a very very. Uh, demanding situation here in India in the outsourcing firm. From a customer perspective, you link the business using a fixed price, you're able to capture the business. 
you use the change management thread, which is in a non-logistic ITIL framework or some other framework which you trust, and you and cash the money. So how would you advise from a contracting perspective? You're talking about the true uh, gyan of contracting, but from a business perspective, business people who go for a business, the appetite is selfish in nature. They have to win that deal, right? So the deal is won through this. This is the mantra. Yeah. And 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 they suck money from the customer using the change part. Yeah, but but. <sighs> That's where I talk about, like, if you're being an agile organization, if you're an agile dev team with a cutthroat, antagonistic, competitive sales team who actually has no, whose interest is in commission and not in the customer's benefits, then you can't be agile. Right? You can use Scrum, you can use XP, you can have backlogs and iterations, but customer collaboration over contract negotiation, individuals and interactions, like, these are the values and the principles of Agile. If your organizational values, or, or divisional, as in your sales values, through expression not necessarily stated, differ substantially and, and, and are completely comp contradictory to the Agile values, then no matter how Agile principles and pra sorry, pra practices you are, you cannot be Agile to the customer. Of the business game, you have five vendors competing for a product, you have a it's about building trust and relationship. Now, some, and that's where I talk about doing the whole T&M stuff first. If you do have to do um, a, a fixed price, like if, the, if, the, if you have to win the contract by fixing everything, because you have competitors who are more cutthroat than you and are willing to screw the customer over, then give them an option. Give them ability to say, look, you and I both know that whatever price we give you, we're going to gouge you with change requests because we're not going to get it right first time. Like everyone knows that. And the vendors and the clients all know that. So let's be honest about it. What we're going to do is, we, is we're going to recommend this. And then, we're going to, and then for two months, we're going to work with you to fully articulate that. And if this doesn't work, if it's not what you want, we'll walk away and we will still have a relationship. And here's the thing. If you have highly antagonistic, highly uh, aggressive sales, I'm going to bet your repeat customers are probably relatively low. Right? These more trust-based models, right, you are actually going to get more and more repeat businesses because you're going to start to build partnerships. They're going to start to come to you. And you can actually start to bypass procurement processes once you get to this level of partnership. OK? Because you can actually I, build I, heads of services and bring it. If you use the TNM model, I've seen it in situations where I had a UK customer. Two months he got for a prototype done. He got all what needs to be done. He got that intelligence, and then he scrapped off the project. Yeah, so we what? We customers also. So from a, I mean, we, we approached from the, this thought process of TNM and then we tweaked the fixed price deal. We went there and we did everything for him. He, he came to understand, he was not able to understand that. He got everything out of the and, and that is the best thing for the customer and for your relationship with the customer, the best thing you could have done. But Projects, if the project is not adding value to the customer, why should they spend 100 million when they could spend 20K no, no, they and learn? They gave it to somebody else. Huh? <laughs> oh, they gave it to somebody else, okay. That's different, and, uh, but, but, but that's the relationship. Like, it's business. Stuff does, like that does happen. All right, one more question, and then I'm completely out of time. I, I am completely question. out of time. Yep. So whether the user's story points will be uh, printed in the contract, that is, uh, these many number of story points will be, so that in that level, we will not be contracted on that. The, as I said earlier, the problem with story points is that they are team-based. You don't have consistent story points across teams. One team, or two different teams estimating for the same activity, depending on whatever reference story they've got to give them the one story point, okay, is that they're going to start, they're going to give you different story point estimates because it's a relative estimate, not an absolute estimate. And what you're doing is putting a relative estimate against an absolute contract. And so unless you have some level of confidence in those story points, and the only way you do that is if you're is if those story points, is if that velocity is for a known team who's done it for the last couple of years. It's the only time putting story points in the contract actually adds value. Because the other thing, story points can be gamed. All right? You want to do 10 story points per iteration? Sure, OK. This one's one, two, three. And, and, and so it doesn't matter. I can, t I can make those story points, whatever I want. But even if we have the same, we, we have the velocity and we derive upon the story points, but that is too risky because the team may vary after the contract as well. That's why I talk about having historical values. So you're going to have, if the team is more or less the same, one person moves out, another person moves in, you're going to have variance and deviations, but it should be within tolerance. So every contract is going to have a small amount of tolerance. It's, it's not going to be, say, 10 story points. It's going to say 8 to 12 story points per iteration. 
All right, so there's going to be allow for some variance. So ranges. that's fine. That's range, yeah, that's absolutely fine. It's where that it's a complete recreation of the team, in which case you effectively have no historical trend to, to draw upon. All right, now, if you have any other questions, come and see me at the front. Um, uh, I have a book for you, thank you very much. Um, so come on up. If anyone has any questions, email me, look me up on LinkedIn, uh, or come and see me. I'm the one in the three-piece suit. Thank you. <laughs>